made it through another year. I am so glad and fired up to see you guys today. I want to start 2020 by asking you a question. Are you ready? Here we go. This is going to be your homework assignment, by the way, so a little heads up. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Not passionate like, ooh, ooh baby, but passionate like what is it in your life that motivates you? Okay, I'm not talking about that kind of passion. I'm talking about, in fact, do you know? what it is that you're passionate about. Maybe, perhaps, I should ask your kids, or your spouse, or your parents, because their answers will be very revealing. I did this. Did this a couple days ago. Got my family together. I said, I want to ask you a question. What am I passionate about? (laughs) Y'all, their responses are hilarious and very revealing. I'm going to share those next week, okay? And that's what you're going to do as well. But what are you passionate about? What I think is so crazy about America and our culture today is it is perfectly fine for you to be 100% passionate about anything and everything except God. Anything and everything except your relationship we got, oh, that's not cool. We don't, we don't do that. That's not politically correct. We don't, we don't do that. But you can be passionate. You can be crazy passionate about sports, about music, you can be crazy passionate about the, the newest tech gadget, fashion, clothes. I got a daughter. <laughs> I get it. She's not in here, is she? she in here? No? Hey, Marin. Hey. She's passionate about fashion. I'm just kidding. She's, she's beautiful about it. We can be passionate about food. Some of us are really passionate about food, right? We could be passionate about restaurants and, and going out and doing all these things. We could be passionate even about movies, right? But the minute you are passionate about God, oh, oh, oh that's, that's a no-no. Negative, Ghost Rider. The pattern is full. This is a no-go zone. And by the way, has anybody seen the trailer for the new Top Gun movie? Yes? Seen, is that, see, see, we're passionate about movies. We think about it. Anybody seen the new Star Wars? Oh, uh, okay, all right, no, 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 no. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've seen the new Star Wars. Oh, church, we got to do better than that. I know I knew who to pray for today. We're passionate about things. We're passionate about movies. We're pas- we could be crazy passionate. We could go to a rock concert like Striper, or we could go to a basketball game, and we could cheer and scream our heads off until we are hoarse. We could even shave the logo in our chest hair. We could be flat out crazy and no one bats an eye about that. But the minute you try to show that kind of passion for God, you're immediately a fanatic. I want you to think about that. There are things working against you to to steal that joy and that passion. There are people who are so fired up about games, they will literally stay up at night working on signs and posters, even at the detriment of their marriage, to say and declare what they are passionate about. Grown men can weep and cry when their score isn't what you want it to be, and the game loses. Grown men can chest bump complete strangers, and no one thinks they say, man, that's a fan. But if we show 10% of that passion for our walk with Christ, they say, you're not a fan, you are a fanatic. Don't do that, man. Don't go near that person, weirdo. (laughs) Right? See, this is the crazy thing. As I started to study this, the creative force behind anything great is passion. Think about it. All great art. All great film, all great cinema, all great architecture, all great literature, you name it. It all is birth. Nothing great accomplishes in life without passion. And nothing great is sustained in life without passion. You need passion. I think we all understand that because passion is what energizes us. It makes the impossible possible. It's what gives us that get up and go attitude where you wake up in the morning and say, that's it, I'm going to do something today. I am fired up and we are going to go, but if we don't have it, man, we start to attack the day like this, <laughs> and it's dull, and life becomes boring, and monotonous, and routine, and we wonder, what's happened? Why have I lost my zip, my, my, my pizzazz, my zip? Passion is what makes good athletes great athletes, drives them to spend hours in the gym, working out, trying to break records. Passion is what allows these Great scientists who stay up all hours trying to find a cure for that dreaded disease. Passion is what allows explorers to boldly go where no man has gone before. I'm going to give you a minute. 
if you see somebody laughing next to you, it's because there is a whole lot of wrong going on up here. And some people's minds, your eyes twitch it a little bit because there's so much wrong. Today we need passion. So here's what I want to do. I want to set the stage for this long series. It is going to be awesome. And I want to, I want to set the context for what's about to happen here. Okay? Jesus is about to drop the truth grenade of truth grenades. He has a gang of people who have come up to him. First it was the Sadducees, then it was the Pharisees, and the Sadducees are back. And now, every time they've come, Jesus has just spanked them. They've got like these verbal, like, oh, what about this? What about this? There's all these horrible questions that are just ridiculous. And we've talked about that before, so I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to fast forward to the good part, where they finally say, we're going to marshal our, our guys for one last assault on Jesus. We're going to send our greatest scholar, a legal lawyer in law and religious studies. He's going to come up, and he's going to, in front of everybody, he's going to ask Jesus a trick question, just to see if we can get him to stumble a little bit. And they come up, and he asked this famous question, teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? And if you've been in church any time, maybe you grew up in church or you read the Bible and you've heard about it, immediately in your mind, you vaguely remember some response of his that says, well, that's easy. The greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And we just kind of rattle it off our tongue. And we just, it's almost like lip service. We, we're so comfortable with it, I don't think we grasp what that really means for us today in 2020. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it again, but we're going to read a different translation, a little bit more modern translation that kind of puts it in a different light. So if you're ready, look at Matthew 22. We're going to read from the MSG translation. Jesus says this, starting in verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. Wait, wait, wait. Pause there. Love others as well as you... Pastor, you don't understand. I can love myself pretty good. I don't have any bit of problem spending a lot of money on myself. I love myself pretty good in a nice house. I love myself pretty good in my fancy car, my nice clothes. I eat out a few times a week. I, are you saying I am supposed to do love others? See, I'm used to like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. See, that's safer. But when I read it like that, love others as well as you love yourself. <laughs> well, that's a little close to home. See, that changed it. That means I have to actually live with passion. I can't just give lip service. Oh, I'll move on. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. Mm -mm -mm. So there it is. One day a man comes up and dares to challenge Jesus and says, what's the most important? And he says, the number one thing in life is I want you to love me passionately. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters unless you love God passionately. I don't want you to live for me half-heartedly. I want it all, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and all your passion. In the Gospel of Mark, it actually records this event, but it has a different word at the end. It has a fourth one. Love him with all your passion, but also love him with all your energy. Isn't that interesting? How are you doing with that? All your energy. I want the focus, the first thing. Look at that word, the very first one. He says passion. Notice that. The Greek word there is actually the word we use for heart. So God is saying, I want you to put your heart into loving me your heart. Put your muscle into it. Put everything. Don't be lukewarm about your relationship with me. Don't be a wimp. He's saying no half-hearted, weak spine, limp-wristed, noodle leg, namby-pamby. It is time to give it all you've got. If you're going to follow me, Jesus says, I want you to do it with passion. And I want you to live your life passionately. And it's not just here. This is all throughout the Bible. We see these incredible verses where God tells us we're to seek him passionately. You doing that? We're to love him passionately. Okay. We're even to serve him passionately. Uh-oh. Well, now you're meddling. Now you're getting into my world. We're to obey God passionately. And we're to trust him passionately. How are you doing with that? And in case we don't get it, if it's not enough throughout Scripture, Colossians 3.23 sums it up and says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for man. He says, I want you to give everything when it comes to loving me, serving me, and living for me. So let's start there. Here it is, 2020, a new year. 2019 is gone. 
Some of you are glad it's gone. Some of you had a great year, and you're, you're kind of sad. You're like, oh, I hope 2020 can outlive it. But I want to do a little inventory. We're not going to ask the questions we usually ask each year. We're going to do something different. Just do a little self-inventory. You don't have to answer out loud. You're safe here. How did you do in 2019 with loving God passionately? What grade would you give yourself? B minus? D plus? How did you do in 2019 with serving God passionately? Got your letter grade in your mind? And the third one. How did you do in 2019 with living for him with passion? If you're here today and you kind of feel like, you know what, I really, if I'm being honest, I've, I've lost my passion. I've lost my pep, lost my zip, my zest, my zeal. That's okay. You are in the right place. You're not alone. If you're here today and you're a little down, maybe even a little depressed, you know what? That's okay. Hear me. You are not alone. You are not a weak person. You are not a bad Christian. What you're experiencing is very normal. Your feelings are real. They're legit. They're probably justified. And maybe you just needed to hear somebody say that today. You're not a bad Christian if you're dealing with this. Every one of us goes through these seasons, and you are safe here. We're going to walk through these struggles together for the next three, four, maybe five weeks. I don't even know how long. I'm over 40 pages right now just in some of this stuff, okay? Just a little, I go through about 10 a sermon, just so you know, all right? So we're looking at four weeks and Wednesday nights too. It's going to be the most practical stuff. I'm dealing with so many great things that I want to share and and, and I want you to know, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and this is not some just self-help quick fix thing. I can't stand those. We can go read a book about that. We're going to look for truth from God's Word, life-changing, applicable truth, and it's going to be awesome. So I hope you guys can hang in there and meet If today doesn't hit your specific need, keep coming, because we will. Today we're going to hit the broadest ones, and it all comes back. Our goal is this. Romans 12, 11 says this, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Don't miss that first word, keep. Notice that. Keep the fires going in your life. We got to focus on that. It is something we have to maintain. Notice that it is not automatic. And this is the lie we believe. If somehow our passion wanes, we think, man, I'm just not really a good Christian. Here I am sliding back in the lukewarmness again. What is wrong with me, right? And the devil comes and pours the guilt on. Hey, pack your bags. We're going on a guilt trip. And you think, that's not, that can't be what God came to do. And we listen to these lies. I want you to know the undiluted truth about this, okay? Hear me. You need to know this. You are not, by nature, passionate about God. None of us are. We live in a fallen world. And we are not born seeking after God. None of us are passionate. It is our job to, to continue to stoke those fires. Literally everything on this planet that the enemy controls conspires to keep you from being passionate about God. So he says here, keep your passion going. Keep your fires going. It's a discipline. It is not automatic. Now, before we go any further, I want to dispel a myth, a popular misconception about passion. Passion has nothing to do with age or personality. Nothing. I can point to so many godly senior believers who have more passion and zeal than ever before. And so can you. And I know many introverts who say, I can't do that, who are passionate about God and they're serving and they keep their focus and their fires are lit because they, ze they keep that zeal. They maintain it. They surround themselves with believers and they, they are living for him and they are on fire. So I wanted to dispel that. We are living in a broken world. It's hurting that it's going to pull us and do everything it can to keep you from being passionate. Let me show you what I mean. A few years ago, we had our, I forget, 12th, 13th year anniversary here at Potter's Ham, and we went and we got all these great helium balloons. <laughs> Try not to pass out. <laughs> and we got like, I can't remember how many. It was dozens and dozens. <laughs> Is that big enough? Okay. We had these helium balloons everywhere. And we put them, we tied them to the speaker stacks, they were up there, we tied them to the drums, we tied them to your tables, legs on the chairs, the back lobby, they were everywhere. We were so excited, y'all, it was looking so good Saturday night. I was so fired up, I could not wait, I was, I was like the, the proud new pastor, I'm like, you guys are going to see it, we're going to sell it, it's going to be awesome. And I come in bright and early Saturday morning, open, um, Sunday morning, open the key, I come in, Ooh. 
every one of the balloons had fallen. Y'all, do you know how deflating that is? No pun intended. <laughs> when you walk in and they are tied to the... Remember, they're not like, okay, they fell, they're on the floor, and now it's like balloons. Every, oh, we're having a rave. It's a disco. We're not talking. It looked cool. It looked pathetic because they were tied on strings. Instead of the strings going up, they were tied on strings, and all the balloons looked like they were filled with lead. And they're like, mmm. it was the ultimate, wah, wah. Here's what happened. They began to dissipate and lose their zeal, their zest. You want to know something so illuminating? This is the deepest spiritual thing. One of the balloons got lost Saturday night, right up there. So high, there's no, the ladder couldn't get it. We were sitting and beating with a stick, couldn't get it, couldn't pop it. We're like, if we don't get that helium balloon down before tomorrow, it's going to get next to those hot lights. And at the worst possible time, probably during a prayer, it is going to, I'm not going to do it. It is going to pop and it is going to freak us all out. And it's going to be the worst thing. I said, we have got to get that down. I went to bed thinking, how are we going to get that down? If I had only known, I didn't have to do a thing. Because by morning, the truth is, they were all down. By the morning, that's what it looked like. Does that sound familiar? A lot of times, y'all, we are just like this. I think when we first become a believer, we think this passion is automatic because we're filled with it. We realize the deal we've got. Man, we are fired up. Are you kidding me? We're talking about all my sins are forgiven? Everything I've done wrong, the things I would never put out in public? All the things that you're telling me, I have a clean slate. I now have purpose. I have passion for getting out of bed. I have a future home in heaven. Plus, you're telling me I have an abundant life now. What a deal. And you're excited about it. You should be, and you're going crazy. But then something happens in life, and you begin to get mired in quicksand of living in a hurting, broken world. And that zest seems to wane a little bit. And your enthusiasm, that's why we're doing this series called Reignite. As we go through God's Word, I want to show you several things that are working against you. Several passion killers. Rick Warren's got a whole book about this. These passion killers that are so insidious, they're so almost, duh, how did I not see it, that they can creep up and you don't even know it is sapping you. And so we're going to shine a bright spotlight of truth on them. And I will probably get through maybe two or three of these today. We'll hit the rest Wednesday and Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday, and we'll see how we do. So I'm not in any rush, but right fast, okay? The first one and the most obvious one a passion killer that robs us of passion is an unbalanced schedule. An unbalanced schedule. In fact, Rick Warren calls this the worst. This is the number one passion killer of all of them because it affects most of us. With an unbalanced schedule, you're either overworked and at your wit's end, or believe it or not, you're underworked. <laughs> now, I know some of you are like, really? Who's that? Yeah, don't point. <laughs> don't point somebody. You're either overworked or you're underworked, and you lose your passion, and you lose your passion because you're out of rhythm, because life has a rhythm. You go through seasons. Man, we go through seasons. Life has seasons, and there's a rhythm to life, and you need both rest and work, and you need both input and output. And too much of either one will cause you to be lopsided, like your tire has a huge bump on it, and you hear it going down the road, and you know it's just driving you crazy. It's imbalanced, and we need that. Too much doing and giving and doing stuff will cause you to lose passion, but also too much nothing, too much boredom can actually cause you to lose your passion because you're not working enough to live out your purpose, and you'll be drained. Some of you said, man, I'd like to do a little bit of boredom and nothing and be, be drained right now. But really? See, in a crowd this size, looking at most people here, we err on the side of too much, too much output. We're always going. We always are working more. And we are always doing that. And we have different personalities, and we can hit either extreme. But I want you to look at what Psalm 127, verse 2 says. It says this, It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing that you're going to starve to death. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Amen. That's awesome. Y'all, that's a refrigerator-worthy one or a note-on-your-bathroom-mirror-worthy verse right there. For some of you, this is your problem. You are always giving out. You are always serving. You're always helping. You're always sharing. You're always working. You're always being generous, and you never have stopped to recharge. And you are burning it and burning it, and sometime we bought into a lie years ago that that was some glorious, noble thing. 
Def Leppard, I think, said it's better to burn out than to fade away, but man, they're not theologians. It's a good song, but it's terrible theology. That's not what we're supposed to do. No one called us. God didn't call you to be over busy. And see what happens when we do that, you get that imbalance. And it could be on the ministry side. It could be on the family side. It could be on the work side. That imbalance leads to what's called compassion fatigue. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's simply this. It means you have cared so much for so many things, so many people for so long that you are slowly draining yourself to where you don't even realize you're empty. And you wake up one day and you realize, oh my goodness, I don't care. I don't care much about anything. I don't care much about God. I don't care much about people. I don't even like people. I don't care much about anything anymore. Why? Because you're burning out from too much output, too much work, too much service. Think of it like this. Let's say this bucket represents your service. Elliot, you want to hold this for me? This sponge is you, and it's dry, but you're doing some good things. You're coming, and you're, you're, you're plugging in, and you're, you're doing some godly things, and so you got a little bit of juice to serve. You're like, okay, all right, I still got some left. And you keep ringing, and you keep ringing, and you keep ringing, till pretty soon you pretty much spent it all, and you never recharged. And then you face another crisis, and what you could have endured easily because you had reserves, suddenly, uh-oh, I'm dry. And that little discussion that you would have handled with grace and Christian maturity now becomes a full-blown heated argument. Why? Because you're wrung out. And what would have easily covered with grace? You're fried. You burnt out. You've got nothing left. You can't pour from an empty cup. If you're leading a group, if you're at a high position in a church or, or in, in a job or some big tower downtown, you can't lead from empty. You've got to recharge. You've got to refill. Otherwise, your sponge is going to crack and it's going to be nasty and you're going to look a thousand years old. And ain't nobody going to want to be with that. Look like a Christian just lost your best friend. We're baptized in prune juice. That is who? Why would they want what we got when we don't even like it? You see what we're saying? When you care and you care and you give and give, you can get compassion fatigue. You've got to refill at some point. We're going to talk about how to do that. Others in you here, I, I won't linger long on this, but you're the exact opposite. You're taken in all the time, and you got real good at it. You know a giver and a taker? You ever have some of those in your family or in your world? There's givers and there's takers, and boy, once you, the scales fall off your eyes, you start seeing it, they're real obvious to spot. There are some, man, maybe if you're doing good things. You could be going to Bible studies, you could be going to seminars, conferences, Christian concerts, workshops, listening to podcasts, all the time. You're always taking in, always learning, always receiving input, but you're never giving any output. You're not sharing it with anybody. You're not mentoring anybody. You're not really doing a ministry to anybody. You're not on mission for it. I mean, you're really just helping yourself. I mean, you're taking in all this food. And it's awesome food, but you're getting fatter and fatter and fatter. Man, pretty soon we're going to have to roll you down the aisle. That's, that's where we get the term holy rollers. True story. That's where we get it. As, as we continue to, we just get like that. And I just get this mental picture of Jabba the Hutt just like, feed me. Right? We're taking it all the time. We're not giving out. We're so out of balance, we don't realize that we're just not feeling good. Except maybe a real life example you eat horribly for December, you step on the scale and you realize you gained 22 pounds. I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> 22, who does that? <laughs> hypothetically, just hypothetically, that person has lost nine of those 22. <laughs> I guarantee you, that person didn't feel the greatest these last few weeks. You know what I'm saying? Because there's an imbalance. When you are gorging and just gorging and gorging and you are just doing nothing but taking in. Let me give you a warning about that because the Bible has a warning for us. Those who only take in without any ministry, without any output, it's dangerous. James addresses this. Look, he says, whoever knows the right things to do and fails to do them, to him it's what? Say it again. It's what? Sin. It's even highlighted there in blue. It's sin. See, the more we know about God and his plan for our life, then the more responsible we are. The more we realize, oh my goodness, I've got responsibility here. 
We're only increasing our judgment when we pack these things in and we don't do it. We're increasing our responsibility. We're not doing anything with it. We have to have balance. And most of us fall in one of these two camps. And you may not know which one, so pray about it. But if you ask your spouse, you might get some illumination there. Or you ask your kids. Thankfully, God's Word gives us the antidote. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says this, Take the time and the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Bodily fitness has a certain value, but spiritual fitness is essential both for this present life and for the life to come. How do you do that? One word, balance. We know we have to be physically fit, and it helps to have a balanced diet. In our spiritual world, it helps to have a balance of spiritual disciplines. This is where it's going to get real. Put your steel toe boots on. How are you doing with spiritual disciplines? Are you kind of just haphazard about it? Well, no wonder we feel kind of lukewarm and we feel kind of like our passion is out. We have to go through these and protect these spiritual disciplines. Why would we expect to be physically fit without doing any work? When we think about their spiritual disciplines, we have to protect our time to worship God corporately and individually. Y'all, that's on us. How are you doing with that? Worship. That's the first spiritual discipline. We need to have time of fellowshipping with other believers, getting together with people who are like-minded, who don't pull you down, but who bring you up. Times of worship, times of fellowship. We have to have times of personal growth when you're getting into God's Word yourself, when you're reading and you're studying and you're gleaning these truths. How are you doing with that? Is it haphazard? Is it take it or go? It's just whatever. If I get it, cool. The fourth spiritual discipline, we need to have a place of ministry. Can't be taking it in and not doing it. Is there a place you're serving others? Is there a place you are not living for yourself? Can you point to something you do, whether it's weekly or bi-weekly or something, where you do it without any fanfare, maybe no one even knows, and you're doing something of ministry to advance God's kingdom. You're pouring out of your gifts, out of the, the abilities that he's given you. And the last one is you need to have a place of mission where you're simply sharing your faith with somebody. You're mentoring somebody. You're pouring your life into somebody, and you are willingly sharing the gospel with them. Those are the five disciplines. And if we're focused and we're good on one, let's say we're good on the fellowship. <laughs> well, that's the easy one. That's like, I, I can eat dessert. Yeah, I, no problem. But if that's all we do, if that's all we take, we are out of balance, and we will inevitably lose our passion. And then you wake up one day, and you go, how come I don't feel close to God like I used to? Yeah, there's why. The second one, an unresolved conflict. Oh, I wish I could skip this one. Oh, wait till the third one. The third one's the worst. But the second one is unresolved conflict because conflict just drains you, man. It sucks the passion right out of you. In fact, I'm going to share a whole message on this coming up on how to deal with people who are sucking the life out of you, who are toxic, who bring you down. And what do you do with that? It is going to be so hard. Don't miss that. But you ever have those great days, you get out of bed, things are going right, you had an awesome breakfast, the shower was great, you had enough hot water, you're catching, I mean, it's just awesome. You just know that you're going to get to work early, you're going to get everything done, your hair looks right, and right as you put your hand on the doorknob to leave, your phone rings and you get the worst news, or somebody just lays into you, or worse yet, it's your spouse, or you have a fight with your kids. And man, two minutes ago, you were singing zippity doo da, and now all of a sudden the zip has left your doo da, and you are just flat like a tire that's just been punctured. You ever have one of those? And it just sucks the joy out of you and the passion. That's what happens. Your attitude suddenly goes flat. Man, some of you are dealing with that every day. And let's be honest, some of you are living in places that are tough. I get it. And you, there are people that you are constantly dealing with where there is that unresolved conflict. And maybe you're doing everything you can, but what do you do about the people when it's mainly coming from somebody? What happens then? Obviously, you can't control them. You can't dictate how they treat you, but you can dictate your response. You can dictate how your emotional state is responding to that in the midst of this storm. That's on us. We have that. They cannot manipulate you. We have the power, and we have to decide, I am going to protect myself, and I'm going to focus, and I am going to protect myself from the toxic, dangerous emotions in fact, there's three of them, and I'm going to give those to you today. How do we handle this conflict? And we're going to go much deeper into it, but for today, let me leave you with the three dangerous red flags, these emotions. The first one, if you start feeling resentment boiling up, red flag. If you start feeling jealousy or envy or prolonged anger, Job talks about this. Look at Job 5.2. It says, resentment kills a fool, and envy, that's jealousy, slays the simple. If you're a note taker, circle the word resentment and circle the word envy. 
because these are passion-killing emotions. Job 18 takes it even further and says this, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. In other words, anger only hurts the angry one. It helps no one, and it hurts you, and it sucks the joy out of you, and your passion will wane. So, are you ready for the naked truth? If you're ready and I can share something heavy, nod your head. Great. For the 17 people who nodded their head, this is for you. Okay, I'm friend to friend. I just want to, when it comes to resentment and jealousy and prolonged anger, only you can make the decision to let that go. Nobody can make that decision for you. Only you can do that. This is why forgiveness is so important. The God who knows you, who made you, who created you, knows you can't carry resentment without it destroying you. You can't do that. And he gives us a way to let it go. If we're being honest with ourselves, even logically, when we're resentful or angry, the person we are angry at couldn't care less. In fact, most of the time, they don't even know how upset you are. And we go around, and you see them walking, and you're like, okay, I'm over it. And then you see them again, right? And if you're not sure if this is you, here's a dead giveaway. Check your social media. I want you to go through your day. If you find yourself with bitterness or resentment towards somebody, and you find yourself silently cyber-stalking them, looking to see, hoping they're just as miserable as you. In fact, I got a picture of some of us right here. If you are like this... <laughs> And you are, you're kind of checking like Shaq, thinking he's going to be sly and high behind this tiny tree. And we're doing that. If you, you know what this is like. This is what resentment does and bitterness. We're sitting here looking. If you're a cyber lurking, but you find yourself just, can we zoom in on this? This is awesome. If this is you, <laughs> and you find yourself cyber lurking, just hoping they're as visible as you, you might have a problem. You might want to talk to Shaq and say, listen, this, I shouldn't matter how miserable they are. We have a problem. If you want the passion to be restored in your heart, you have got to forgive. To quote the great theologian, Queen Elsa of Arendelle, you have got to let it go, let it go, can't hold it back. Right? This is what we have to do. Now, I want to get into realville for a second, because some of you go, pastor, you don't know what they've done. Can't do it. I can't let this go. Are you asking me to forget about what they've done? Are you telling me to just let it go? How can I possibly do that? There's no way I could let them off the hook. I get it. I'm not asking you to let them off the hook. I'm asking you to let them off your hook and put them on God's hook. That changes everything. You let them off your hook and you put them in God's hands. How do you do that? The process begins by very openly and very candidly admitting to God, God, I can't handle this. This person is sapping the joy and the passion out of my life. I can't forgive them. Nothing in me, what they did was wrong. I can't do this, but you can. I want to forgive them. I want to leave this with you. Will you help me? Will you help me forgive them and move forward and leave this in your hands. If you don't begin with that first step, that healing process, and begin to give this to God, this unforgiveness is going to kill the passion in your life. I can see the light in so many of your eyes. Some of you are not, you know what this, or you know somebody who you are watching being eaten alive by bitterness, by unresolved conflict. The third cause for the loss of passion in our lives, and this will be the last one for today. This one's a doozy. An unconfessed sin. Oh, pastor, why you got to go? Let's go talk about Shaq some more. An unconfessed sin. Few things will rob you of your joy and your passion more than this. And this can affect anyone. See, guilt quickly overwhelms us when we have this, this unconfessed sin. Here's how it works. Most of the time, we as humans do not naturally strut around all chipper and bold, singing, what a glorious day. I've got a truckload of sin in my life. I'm a guilty person. woo None of us do that. You know what we do consciously? Check this out. We rationalize it. When we're dealing with a sin, what we do is we say, you know what? It's not that big a deal. They're doing it. They're doing it. Everybody's doing it. It's not that big a deal. You know, it, it may have been a big deal a couple hundred years ago, but culture's changed. Things are different now. 
Morals have been redefined, and Scripture's just kind of, it's vague and wispy. No, it's not. <laughs> that's us that's changed. God's standard hadn't changed. And here we are, we're looking at this, and someday we've rationalized things that we knew once were, were absolute abominations, and now they're fine. See, consciously, we rationalize, but subconsciously, we don't. It gnaws at us. See, subconsciously, it chews us, right? In the quiet moments of the night, that guilt comes, pops in your head. In fact, some of you right now are having guilt and conviction pop into your head. You think, man, that's just creepy. I'm not reading your mind. I'm a human. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, ate the bag of chips. I understand. Guilt doesn't go away on its own. Thankfully, God has provided a way. See, here's, here's the truth. You can't feel enthusiasm and guilt at the same time. It never works. You can't feel guilt and passion at the same time. It is impossible. So if you don't have any passion in life, let's do a check on this third one. Do you have guilt? Maybe it's conviction. I like to think that guilt kind of comes from the enemy, but conviction, that's good. That comes from the Holy Spirit. You know why you can't feel guilt and passion at the same time? Because guilt, by its very nature, robs you of joy and passion. That's what it does, and it makes us feel this way. In fact, look at Psalm 38 here. This is a beautiful thing. Listen to how it describes it. My guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. I'm bent over. I'm racked with pain all day long. By the way, I skip verse 5. I skipped verse 5 because it is too graphic. I'm not even going to read it. You, read, you go read this whole psalm later, okay, in the message translation. All day long I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me. My health is broken. I'm exhausted. I'm completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. Y'all, we are not meant to live with guilt, but some of us are. Guess what? He's provided a way to be done with that. The good news is Jesus came to earth, died on a cross to take that. He says, I have a gift for you, a gift of forgiveness of sin and a gift of freedom from guilt and shame. That's God's good gift. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to share just a closing little story. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come up. We're going to sing our final song and we're going to be done. Most of you know I have a daughter who's in preschool. This is Mercy Hope. She's attending the preschool here, and she absolutely loves it. We have the best teachers and the best director. Oh, my goodness, it's phenomenal. And one of the things she has taught us is one of the teachers has this great saying, and it's whenever they come up with an incorrigible kid who's not really doing the right thing, they'll stop and they'll, they'll lock eyes and they'll go, good news, Mercy, you have a chance to make a better decision. And it's like, what? what? Good news, Mercy. I know you want those 17 Oreos, but we're going to have a feast in just a minute, so we're going to eat these later. And like, oh, that sounds great, right? Good news. And they go on, and it is incredible. And it works. We're doing it. My wife's even doing it to me. These are things that it just, it blows my mind. It is so hilarious. Good news, Mercy. You can make, y'all, good news, church. Good news, church. The problem of unconfessed sin and guilt can be fixed quickly. This is one of the few quick fixes because it doesn't depend on you. It depends on Christ and us giving it. You could do something about it now. Some of us carry guilt around for days and weeks and months. Man, we, don't, we shouldn't carry it another hour. The good news of 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he can be trusted. He is faithful to forgive our sins. He can cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Y'all, that's his promise. You don't have to hope, guess, pray, wonder. It's a promise. To confess means you verbalize this and you agree with God. You agree that sin is as hideous as he says it is. You agree with him and then you admit it and you don't, you don't hold it back. You put it right out of the light and say, what I did was wrong. God, I agree with you and I want to live the way you want me to live. Would you free me from this? You can do it now. Can I pray for you? Let's bow together. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Father, I pray for my friends. We've all been there. I pray that you would take away our guilt and our shame. We confess to you, Lord, our sinfulness, our sinful nature, Lord, and we pray that you would cleanse us and wipe the slate clean, not because of works of righteousness or anything we've done to earn it, but because of what Jesus accomplished and finished on the cross, the perfect sacrifice, the blameless Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God, I pray that that blood would wash us white as snow. Will you take my guilt, my shame, my sin, 
Lord, we stand on your promise of what we just read in 1 John, and we thank you for offering forgiveness and cleansing. God, restore our passion. What a privilege it is to start this new year off with a clean slate with you. Thank you for your peace. It's in Christ's name, amen.